praise the Lord. This morning I want to talk about being anointed by God. You know, there seems to be a belief in the body of Christ that some people are more anointed by God than others. But I want to show you today that this is not altogether true. Mainly because of what the cross of Jesus Christ did for humanity. He died, was buried, resurrected, and ascended. But not only that, he sent the Holy Spirit so that every believer can receive the anointing of God. You got to know that is for you. The Bible says when you accept Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit live inside of you. I've said that scripture more than once. And it's in the book of John, I believe in chapter 14. But the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit live in each one of us. Not just the star minister or the pastor or the evangelist or this or that. John 16, 7 says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit in the New Testament for whosoever, keep that in your mind, is whosoever, it's not for the elite, it's not for the special, it's for whosoever would believe and receive the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. It can't be bought and paid for, it can't be marketed, it is something that we receive. 1 John 2 Verses 20 and 27. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. He's talking about believers right here. John is talking about believers. People that have received Jesus Christ as the Lord. Not the fivefold ministry. Not anything like that. It's talking about believers here. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, you inside of you listening to this. And ye know all things. Verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it hath taught you ye shall abide in him so the holy one is the holy spirit and we receive the holy spirit when we become a christian it's not talking about the the baptism experience and you can look that up in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. It says, no man can confess Jesus as Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. But we've talked about an additional experience that Jesus told the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high. And verse 27 says, we have received the Holy Spirit's anointing. So Jesus lives and dwells in us. And he said the Holy Spirit would teach us all things. He lives in every believer. And he, he said the anointing which you have received of him. And that, that him is the Holy Spirit, the Holy One. John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, 
but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he shall show you things to come and in those scriptures in john jesus mentions that the world does not even know that the holy spirit exists so the holy spirit is for believers that come to jesus christ and he dwells in them so what does the term to be anointed mean what does it mean i already said in the beginning is not that somebody's more anointed than others that's just something that has gone around in the body of christ but i want to dispel that this morning what does the term to be anointed mean anointing of god means being set apart for his service that's all it means being set apart and if you are born again listening to this you are set apart so the anointing in the old testament was a physical anointing with oil used to indicate being set apart to be used by God it was physical in the Old Testament and God gave Moses a recipe to make up the oil used to anoint the tabernacle and its contents and to anoint Aaron and his sons we can see this Exodus chapter 30 verses 22 through 30 moreover the lord spake unto moses saying take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh 500 shekels and of sweet cinnamon half so much even 250 shekels of sweet calamus 250 shekels Verse 24, and of Cassia, 500 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary and of oil, olive, and hen, H-I-N. Verse 25, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith and the ark of the testimony and the table and all his vessels and the candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot and thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy whatsoever touches them shall be holy and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office now this was fulfilled Moses fulfilled the commandment of God one book over in Leviticus 8 10 through 12 and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them and he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels both the laver and his foot to sanctify them and he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him I just wanted to give you an idea or a picture of what was done in the Old Testament to sanctify and set apart they used anointing oil and the tabernacle and all its contents and Aaron and sons were set apart to the service of God by the anointing oil. 
And so the sons of Aaron were also anointed as part of the priesthood in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 30. You can read that at your leisure. The Bible also shows the, that kings were also set apart by the anointing of oil. Samuel anointed Saul, king of Israel, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And Saul lost it all because of his disobedience. But he was set apart as commander over God's inheritance among his people Israel. Samuel also anointed King David in 1 Samuel 16 verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the Lord came upon David. Just remember that upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. David's son Solomon was anointed king over Israel in 1 Kings 1.39. And Zadok, the priest, took an horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet and all the people said, God save King Solomon. There's a couple of more and you can study these later. Elijah was instructed to anoint three people. Hazel as king over Syria. Jehu as king over Israel. Elijah as prophet in the place of himself. In 1 Kings 19 verses 16 through 17. Joash was anointed king of Judah in 2 Kings 11:12. Johahaz, the son of Josiah, was anointed king in his father's place in 2 Kings 23:30. It's also important to note that the Holy Spirit did not indwell any person in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you mostly see it saying that the Spirit of God came upon, but not dwelled in Old Testament believers. But as New Testament believers, we have the privilege of having the Holy Spirit live inside of us. This privilege could not happen until after the blood of Jesus was shed. Jesus said, in John 14, 17, the spirit of truth shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit lives in us, whereas in the Old Testament, he came upon them. Amen. So concerning the use of oil, we still use oil in the New Testament when we anoint and pray for people. Oil is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. The others are a dove, fire, wind, and water. An example of the use of physical oil in the New Testament is in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. It says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith, it didn't say the oil, it said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So that oil represents the Holy Spirit. The oil itself has zero power. And verse 15 says, the Lord shall raise him up. 
But just know it does not have to be an elder to pray for the sick. See the Great Commission. I'm going to give that scripture later. But believers, Jesus said, you shall pray for the sick and they shall recover. Yes, this scripture is talking about the elders, but Jesus gave believers power to pray for the sick. Amen. So here we are in the New Testament where Jesus Christ alone is is the anointed king of kings and the lord of lords he is the anointed king of kings and lord of lords but after the holy spirit descended upon jesus he was driven by the spirit to be tempted by the devil after his victory over the devil in the wilderness in luke 4 the Bible shows he went into the synagogue and quoted the scripture from Isaiah about himself in Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 19. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's in the King James. It just means Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If we're supposed to be like Jesus, doesn't that scripture apply to us as believers? That's the ministry of Jesus Christ right there. He is the anointed king and priest, but he has called all believers to his work. All believers, all believers. God's anointing is on every believer. No one can claim any special status or ranking over anybody else. All believers have the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living inside of them. Get that in your spirit. The pastor is not better than you. The evangelists, none of them are better than anybody else. We live under the New Testament or New Covenant and have been called to God by His grace. We no longer live under the law, but the grace of God. However, the illustrations and types from the Old Testament apply to us as believers today. You can see that in Romans 15, 4. As believers, we are all anointed by God. As believers, say it to yourself, say it out loud if you want to. But as believers, we are all anointed by God. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it was a physical thing that was done. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the one that anoints the believer. You are anointed if you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20 and 22, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And verse 21 is the important verse. Now he who established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us 
is God. Paul was talking to the church of Corinth. He was telling them that who has anointed you is God. Who has established you is God. Not any minister, not any somebody because they laid their hands on you. It is God. Yes, we pray for people. We anoint them with oil. But Elisha wanted what Elijah had. And Elijah said, it's not mine to give. It's God that gives the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Not any oil, not any minister, not any pastor, not any evangelist. It is God. Yes, God works through his people. We got to keep people in perspective and not make them gods. The people are people just like you. If somebody, if some minister prays for you and you feel the spirit of God come upon you and God does something inside of you, you got to praise God. I think in the body of Christ that a lot of times we see the worship of people and putting people up on pedestals and making people idols. And it takes away from the worship of God. I preached about that already. We are clearly told that God has established and anointed us. He has also set us apart in Christ. So it's God that does it. It's not the minister. It is God. It's God's anointing. And how does this happen? The answer by being born again. Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the moment you are born again, you are set apart for the use of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God. You're just as powerful as you're, yes, albeit you're a baby, but you're just as powerful as the most powerful Christian. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. It's not the years in the ministry. It's not human years that make a minister. It is Jesus Christ and how the word is applied in your life. If you choose to apply the word of God to your life, God will begin to form in you what he wants you to do in this life. But if you just read it as it's just words on a page and then go about your business, then the word of God is not going to work in you. It's not going to work. Hey, you may be born again, but I'm not going to go there this morning. We can't take being born again for granted. We can't say I'm born again. Now I can just go on over here and do what I want. I'm born again. I have, when I die, I'm going to heaven. I said the sinner's prayer, but I'm living like the devil. I'm going to heaven. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to heaven. I said the sinner's prayer. You know, there's more in the Bible than being born again, than the doctrine of salvation. We've got to take the whole word and look at it and let corresponding scriptures corresponding scriptures build on each other we can't take a scripture out of context take that scripture and say this is it this is my security blanket i don't have to do anything else i can live the way i used to live if i want to i can say a prayer with my mouth and just live the way i used to live god doesn't care god does care about sin It says it's enmity against God in Romans. But Jesus answered and said to him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In John chapter 3, verse 3, 
And we all know that Nicodemus came and said, how can a, a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Because he was not seeing it spiritually. And that's when we become born again. Our spiritual eyes, the Bible says we're a new creation. Our spiritual eyes and ears are supposed to open and we're supposed to help them open by getting in the Bible, getting in the word of God and doing the things of God, such as prayer, such as fellowship, such as using that word. I talked about last week uh, using that word that we put inside of us to go out. And when the spirit of God or when you feel the unction of God tugging you towards somebody to witness to them to say something to them about jesus go ahead and say something to them about jesus and then god can use that you take that step forward god's gonna push you keep pushing you ahead and you will keep growing in the spirit but if you just say the sinner's prayer and go on about your business you're not going to grow. Matter of fact, you're going to be like a plant that is planted in the ground and somebody doesn't water it. You're going to die. Spiritually. And you will drift back into your old ways of doing things. Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not on your life. Your heart has, it is hard towards God. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit has to be on a believer's life because you're still in this human body, in this fleshy body. And if the conviction of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit can't show you anything, can't show you if you're going in the wrong directions, then you're in danger. That's all I can say for you. I'm not God, but I read his word and we have to look at corresponding scriptures and scriptures that build upon a doctrine. And I'm talking about the doctrine of salvation. So being born again means turning from our sins to the best of our ability. We turn. Yes, God is so merciful. I, I can't say enough about the mercy of God and the grace of God. I'm not trying to preach a hellfire and brimstone sermon. I don't believe in hellfire and brimstone sermons. I said it before. Because they're based on fear. And we are not to use fear to get people into the kingdom of God is is a decision decision that somebody freely makes. If they want to serve Jesus or they don't, if they want to live for God, if they don't or if they want to straddle the fence. And if you're straddling the fence, you're in danger. Because the flesh is a powerful thing, not to mention we said our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're sitting ducks for all of them. The only refuge we have is Jesus Christ is what I'm trying to say. We confess that Jesus is Lord and ask him to take control of our heart and life. We must confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts. That Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. It's in Romans 10 9. We follow the word of God to the best of our ability. Specifically Mark 12 30. Which says we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. And our neighbors as ourselves. Mark 12 30. And as we do Mark 12, 30 to the best of our abilities and we can see ourselves what road we're going down. We need to ask the Holy Ghost to let us see ourselves what road we're going down. Because if we can't see ourselves, we're in danger. If nobody else can tell us, especially if nobody else can tell you, if you can't, if I can't see myself and then nobody else can tell me nothing, then I'm be deaf. I'm deaf and blind spiritually praise the lord so as we do mark 12 30 the holy spirit comes dwells within us and we are set apart 
set apart, anointed, set apart, sanctified for the use, for God's uses. The Bible says we are new creations. Old things are passed away. Those old things start creeping back in your life. They not passed away. They still there. They creep back in and they get back in and you can't fight them. You can't resist them. They're in there. They not passed away. They pass away when we want them to pass away. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible calls those that belong to Jesus Christ kings and priests. So we don't need somebody to come and pour oil on us to make us a king and priest. The Bible says when we accept Jesus Christ and the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost lives inside of us, we are kings and priests. Here are a couple of scriptures that show the believer is called to be a king and a priest in the kingdom of God in 1 Peter 2, 9. For ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Can you hear that call? He called you out of darkness. Now, if I decide to go back into the darkness, that's my will. That's my decision. Is God going to let me go? No. He's going to try to woo me. He's going to try to pull me. That's the grace of God. In the Old Testament, the people did not approach God directly. A priest acted as a go-between God and man. But Jesus' victory on the cross changed that. Now we can come directly into God's presence in Hebrews 4.16. We have the responsibility of bringing others to him also as ambassadors for Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. Revelation 1, 6, kings and priests, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. We're already royalty in God's kingdom. Don't hesitate to witness for the Lord. You may feel you don't have a stunning testimony. But witness for the Lord because of what he has done for you. Not because of what you have done for him. What has he done for you? And that previous verse in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 says he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Will God anoint us as kings and priests? What's the answer? Yes, he will. Because we are called to be kings and priests set apart. Just like the Old Testament kings set apart for the service of God. God's anointing is upon us in the same way it was upon Jesus Christ. You remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Bible says the spirit as a dove came upon him. And the father spoke from heaven. He's the father, son, the Holy Spirit. The father spoke from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So we receive the Holy Spirit when we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts. God's anointing is upon us in the same way it was upon Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the anointing was a physical experience as we saw in Exodus 30 and Le Leviticus 8. But in the New Testament, the oil is not a physical oil. The holy oil is the Holy Spirit which comes upon 
the believer? Are we treating our vessels like it's like God is in there? Do we treat our vessels, our bodies like it belongs to us or like it belongs to God? Praise the Lord. I didn't hear any takers on that. <laughs> Romans 8, 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, use that scripture against the spirit of fear. When it comes on you, when your mind is thinking these thoughts that haven't even occurred yet, you say, God, I you say, I don't have the spirit of bondage around me again to fear according to the word. But I have received the spirit of adoption. And the more you say it, the more your spirit man will believe it. When we come to Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit anoints us and sets us apart for the service of God. The Bible shows that we as believers are supposed to do the work of Jesus Christ. In a cult is all about the leaders. Any cult that you know that you've heard of is all about that leader. Yes, the cult has followers, but that leader is the one that dictates. In the body of Christ, it's all about the work of Jesus Christ, not just about the pastor, the leaders, or the ones that are anointed. I just showed you, if you're a believer, you're anointed. If you're a believer, you're anointed. Simple as that. We respect God's leaders, but not worship them. Not make them an idol. I can't do it unless my pastor does it for me. I can't pray for my, I can't overcome it unless my pastor prays for me. Or my favorite minister you have the same, we have the same Jesus living inside of us. The same Jesus. That's how the volume of the work of God can get done. When everybody that's a believer obeys the great commission of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on the earth. He gave his disciples the power to use his name. In Matthew 10, 1, I'm not going to read every scripture. Matthew 10, 8. He told them to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely. You have received freely give. We have freely received from the throne of God. We should be freely giving. And the only way we can freely give is to step out. Step that take that step out. I told y'all about my public speaking. Public speaking. I had to step out or else I would have made an F. You got to take that first step. It's inside of you. You put the word in you. You step out. It's unknown territory. You just do the word. We're not required to wonder if it's going to work or not. We just do the word. God will surprise you. He'll surprise you. Mark 6, 7. And he called to him the 12 and began to send them forth two by two. And gave them power over unclean spirits. So he was giving a pattern of what's supposed to happen when he goes back to glory. See, he was in a, a limited body. He came from an all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present God to a person in a limited body. But he still designated his disciples. 
So he was setting the stage for when he went back into his omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. For his believers to do the same work that the disciples did. He said it before he went back to heaven. He said for his disciples. And, and when we read the Bible, he's talking to us. It's a letter to us. It's not just a story. It's a living letter that will never die. It's a living letter to us. Luke 10, verses 17 through 19. And this is where he sent out the 70 and they returned again saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power he's talking to me behold i give unto you when if you're reading that he's talking to you he's not talking to the 70 the 70 long gone i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you when you first start riding that bike with the training wheels on it you were wobbly on it but finally, you made up in your mind you're going to do it. The, the training wheels came off, but you still had, to, still had to have daddy, mama there to help you hold you up a little bit. But you said, no, daddy, I got it. You start riding a bike. The same in the spirit realm. You have to step out. You have to do the work of God. You have to speak in passing. The only way I learned, I was an overzealot when I first started witnessing. I was too zealous. But God had to teach me. He takes our mistakes and then he perfects us. And he's still perfecting me. He's still maturing me. But you got to take, take that step out. We can't wait for somebody else to do the work of God for us. We got to do it ourselves. If you ask Jesus to come live inside of you, you are his disciple. Just like the 12 were. You're his disciple. There's no difference. Jesus also gave us power to be witnesses for him in Acts 1.8. So if Jesus gave his disciples authority, how much more? Do we have the authority to do what Jesus did now that he's back in heaven? He told us to do it before he left. He needs believers to work in his kingdom today. He said the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Am I willing to work in the harvest field of God Am I willing to put my hand to the plow and help carry the load? The Bible is written to us today. We are his disciples here on this earth. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he gave a great commission in Mark chapter 16. Verses 15 through 20. And he said unto them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. There's your anointing. That's your anointing right there. You've got the anointing if you're a believer. Shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick 
and they shall recover. So then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The word working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Just if you're out and about in your travels, no matter how nervous you might feel, talk to God about it. Pray about it. Pray, just ask the Lord if you, if, if the Lord wants you to witness or minister or say something to someone about Jesus, just tell him you're willing. God, I'm willing. If you open up the opportunity, use me to witness for you. And use that word of God that's been planted in you. And God will grow you. God will grow you. That's how he grows you. In Jesus name. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus. You have anointed us, Lord. You, God, have anointed us. So, Father, we pray that we can walk in that anointing. We pray, Father, that you would use us in the way that you fit, see fit, God, in the name of Jesus. We bind the powers of the enemy that are standing between us and walking in all that God wants us to be in the name of Jesus. We come against every hindrance in Jesus' name. And we loose the spirit of God, Lord, of their sin in our lives. Oh, Father, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to help us to grow in us and to overcome and be, be victorious over the things that so easily beset us in sin, God. We pray that you work in our hearts and keep it soft, Lord, and pliable for you, Father, so that we can be used of you in our days on this earth we pray, Lord, for each and every person that's attached to Answers to Life ministry, Lord, that you would strengthen them, encourage them in their walk with you. Let them see some victories in their lives, in their prayer lives, God, in the name of Jesus. We pray for lost loved ones, marriages, relationships in Jesus' name, Father. We pray for your move, God, in the name of Jesus as we stand in prayer. We loose the hunger for prayer and for the things of God and the word of God in our spirits, Lord, that we always yearn for you, God, and your spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that you never take your Holy Spirit from us, O oh God, that you would always cause us to be humble and meek and have your love growing in our hearts and our lives and overtake our heart, Lord, and give us a new heart of flesh in the name of jesus if we have a stony heart because of bitterness unforgiveness we matter our wife son daughter other family members some outside person god we ask you to forgive us for any unforgiveness and bitterness that's in our hearts lord that quench your spirit we pray father that we can grow into forgiving god as your whole plan for mankind was forgiveness so it is important to you and it should be to us as well father in the name of jesus we thank you and we praise you lord in the name of jesus that we can stay sanctified and set apart for your use for your glory in jesus christ's name and we thank you lord that we only put you as our god not any human being in jesus name amen praise the lord